So thank you for touching on um, how the um, how Brexit in general has affected um, university networks as well as, well as students and staff. Um, we wanted to know particularly with the ongoing uncertainty over the past year, um, for example, how ha and um, the effects felt by students, um, especially year abroad students, Erasmus students, and EU students. Um, how has the university been? Uh, dealing with the ongoing uncertainty that they feel as well as particularly you mentioned the global networks and the alliances that the university has I want to know if there are intentions that may have may have risen as a result of um, the Brexit uncertainty okay lots, lots there so um, first of all Erasmus networks and uh, study abroad network absolutely crucial key part of what we are and what we try to do uh, and of course we'll support um, all those commitments that we've made to students that will, they will have those experiences um, we've been in touch with every single one of the universities with whom we have um, bilateral or multilateral arrangements, which is somewhere over 400, to make absolutely sure that everyone is uh, focused on what we will do in all the scenarios, from no deal to remain, uh, from all, all the possible scenarios, to make sure that we're absolutely secure for, uh, for this year going into next year. Uh, beyond that really is going to depend on what the situation is going to be. Our commitment is that we absolutely will provide uh, uh, more mobility options than we have at the moment in the future, which is one of the reasons that European University Network is so important, because it will give us an opportunity of framework in the worst case Brexit outcomes for, for significant mobility options. We've been developing a lot of those, those networks, as you say, and um, haven't found particularly strong tensions. So, um, for example, one of the interesting things recently, we're doing a lot of work uh, with some of the Chinese universities and Chinese Academy of Sciences, for example, um, and in a recent meeting, Chinese Academy of Sciences said we'd be really interested in having a meeting with your European University network as well as just with Warwick. So I think there are ways of building those kind of collaborations. Um, I, I think one of the reasons that we don't have perhaps some of the tensions elsewhere is um, I think our position has been pretty clear. Um, we are a European university. We are an international university. That European University network competition 17 networks were uh, supported by the European Union, something like 120 universities, only three British, which may say, may be an indicator that others are not quite so clear on their position going forward. Um, when people talk about um, you know, global Britain and all this kind of stuff, well, I mean, a university has to be global. So, you know, not as a British institution, but a global institution being global. So I don't think we've had those sorts of tensions for that reason. Um, our next question is, do you think the university is playing a part in the commercialisation of higher education by increasing the number of courses they put in clearing each year? Um, no. But I need to think about that because I haven't had the question put quite that way before. It's an interesting way of putting it. So um, let, me, let me try and say a few things that might help or might not. Um, it depends what we mean by commercialisation and marketisation. So one of the elements at the core of, um, for example, putting more courses into clearing is choice. So is choice, student choice, a part of a marketised system or not? Um, I think we need more clarity really about what we mean about a number of these things. Um, what, one of the things that we do when we go towards clearing, of course it's clearing and adjustment. So one of the purposes of that is that we know that there are students uh, who do better than they thought they would do often from less advantaged backgrounds, who when they get the results, look at Warwick and think, well, maybe I can come to Warwick after all. And one of the things that we want to do is to try to open up those routes. There are many routes, but that's just one of the routes for people from less advantaged backgrounds to come into this university. The wider point, I don't know if you're going to ask the wider point about marketisation, but if I put down a marker, you can come back to it later on if you want to, um, is a huge challenge. You know, I think it is entirely unclear in government policy now how they see the university sector. Uh, do they see it as, as a quasi-privatised area, or do they see it as, as a charity sector to be regulated? And I think depending on which government minister you listen to, you can get either of those sorts of answers. So you briefly touched on um, the, 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 how the funding is determined according to different kind of courses, and we also had a very similar question mm -hmm. on that. So would you agree that if the auger review was passed, that government funding should be adjusted for different degree subjects with respect to graduate earnings in order to reflect their economic value and teaching costs? And how will this in particular affect students from less advantaged backgrounds, for example? Yeah, I wouldn't support that for, for, for a second. 
um, that's absolutely the wrong way to, to go. And, and again, I think depending on who you listen to in government, some have moved away from, from that kind of idea. Um, and that is, a, of course, by definition, a highly marketised idea that you know the, the value of your of your salary at the end should uh, be directly related to the value of the of the fee, and uh, you know, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. I hope it won't come forward again. I hope that's not the way forward. Um, our argument, my argument, has always been that you need to support all subjects equally. Some need additional top-up funding. So if you are doing medicine, that costs a lot of money a lot of money to do a lot of work that has to be taking place in the training of a student, in the education, in a hospital, in the health service and so on. So there, there will need to be government top-ups for medicine and for some other high cost subjects. Um, if you have a laboratory, depending on what courses you're doing, some of you may be working in laboratories. The laboratories are by definition more complicated and costly to run than classrooms. So we need additional support for those, but by function it's not defined by salary outcomes. How in the coming year will the university balance these recently announced environmental commitments and its ties to the automotive and manufacturing industries, so like WMG. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you. So, so I'll just um, uh, just focus a bit on that at the moment. So, so the ties that we've got there at the moment, the bi the big research work at the moment is about electric vehicles, is about the batteries behind electric vehicles, uh, is about light weighting the the cars themselves, so those batteries will go further. It is all about that autonomous, connected electric car of the future. Um, the initial vehicles I was just referring to will be relatively small, maybe sort of four to six people. Um, one, of the, one of the first places that collectively we think that we might be able to make some real impact is, is the short journeys. So 80% of petrol driven cars go less than five miles. So if you can take all that out because you've got a, a different electric, uh, uh, ideally eventually autonomous uh, vehicle to do that for you, that's a quick win. That's a quick win for people. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, though, um, there's a huge amount of work on, on the battery side because, of course, an awful lot of everything we're talking about here in terms of electric um, uh, work, electric vehicles, electric um, mobility depends on the batteries being right. And we've got a, a big stake in a thing called the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre, which is opening very soon, um, which is all about how do you produce the sort of batteries we need in sufficient numbers, this is a big challenge, so that the whole of um, the, the UK car fleet can move across into, into that kind of space. But again, that's not enough. Let me go back to the question you were asking. That's not enough. When you, when you put one of these batteries into a car, it will run out at a point, the battery, where it still has 80% of its life left. So can we take that battery and then give it a second life? And some of these vehicles we are just talking about that will go relatively short distances, they might take that battery from 80% to 60%, 50%. So can we think about a third life? Can we take some of these batteries at 50% or, or possibly even less and put them onto our green fields to store uh, electricity generated by, by wind or, or by, by solar, whatever it might be, so we don't have the classic problem at the moment of you, know, you get renewables when the wind blows, but when the wind doesn't blow, there's a blooming gas fire power station you know, pumping the... Can we use batteries in that way as well? So it, it very much is in that, uh, in that kind of space. And the very last thing on this is that if we can get some real success in this, uh, this domain, we've got an opportunity of being part of something called a gigafactory. And the point of the gigafactory is to, these really aren't my words, you can tell, <laughs> I'm, I'm not an engineer, these really aren't my words, but the point of the gigafactory is to be able to go to, to a really commercial level of, of production. So that's not for us to make money out of, that's for us to be part of the research and design team to take what will be done in the battery um, industrialization center into a place where these, these uh, batteries can be commercially produced. And if all that works, there'll be a lot of really high quality jobs for country. So on the topic of overcrowding, work students are reportedly already feeling the effects of it. For example, sitting in corridors after failing to find any available spaces to study on campus. Given that new building projects will not come into fruition until that late next year, how will the university combat overcrowding issues, especially during busier times such as exam season? So we're, built, we're, we're creating a lot more study spaces. Because um, if it's a study space, space, a problem that you're specifically talking about, we know that is a real issue. And uh, we've, we've had a big project of going around with the SU, going around campus and looking to see where we can designate more areas as being space for not just um, students to, to study, but just to be in as well. Uh, because as you say, when you come off of Leamington, if you've got electric morning, you don't want to go back if you've got to come back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So how do we create more space? And that's, that's one of those projects that it's really difficult to give like a big answer to because it, it really is a building by building, space by space piece of work. Um, so I'd encourage 
you and others uh, to work with us, to work with the SU, to try to also identify some of that space where space is not used that much. That's a really big part of the, of the issue. There is more capacity coming online, exactly as you say. We're looking at um, enacting the creation of more space for uh, in, in the halls of residence that we're building as well, which doesn't help you guys who are in your second or know, people in the third year. But if people in the first year are not using quite as much space on campus, then that is helpful as well. And it's just a really detailed piece of work that, that we're having to do. In the ideal world, we never live in an ideal world, but in an ideal world, we'd have done quite a lot of the building a couple of years back. We'd have been a bit ahead of this, but we couldn't afford to do it at that point, and so we are where we are now. What we have done, though, I think is a really good job. I hope you agree. Um, quite a few universities have had challenges, and we did a few years ago, having enough accommodation open in place for people on arrival to our term. And there's been a fantastic amount of effort by colleagues and, and investment to make sure that is not a problem that we have. Um, to the extent to which we now make sure that each year for uh, new students arriving, um, there is more accommodation than students arriving. So there will always be a spare room, rather than where we used to be, which was to try to get it exactly on, and it was just impossible to get it exactly on. So I think that's been progress. We've, we've built a lot more teaching space. Um, and refurbished a lot more teaching space, so I think that's that's a good piece of news as well. But I completely recognise what you're saying. This study and dwell space, this is something we're trying to work out. Um, we have worked out, we've created more, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, so the ill mental health of university students is a recurring subject uh, covered in the national news. Um, do you think that the current mitigating circumstances and extension systems at Warwick work for students who apply for them due to mental health? So <clears throat> let me answer that in, with three bits. First bit, um, I get very uh, frustrated with the national debate about mental health issues in students because um, actually if you look at all the data, the challenges around mental health are young people as a whole. It's, mm -hmm. not, just, it's not a student specific problem. Um, in fact, very, very slightly, it's less likely to be the case if you're a student than if you're not a student. Um, what do we then do with that as a, as a university? Well, I think the second thing I want to say is that um, over the last 10 years, whatever your politics, um, austerity has bitten really deeply. And what austerity has done is it's hollowed out the state. And there are a series of areas where we can see this. We see this in the police, where we have, to, we have to carry out more police functions now because there are fewer police officers. And we see this in lots of areas of health. So mental health provision now must be provided by the universities because you get such relatively less good uh, support from the NHS. I was making sure I wasn't saying the wrong thing there. Uh, less good from the NHS. So now in the new system that we brought in, I'm getting to your third point. <laughs> the new system we brought in um, is is one of, of specialism and uh, speedy reaction. So somebody arrives, says they've got a, a challenge at well-being uh, in terms of mental health, or a parent is in touch, a family is in touch, friends are in touch, a tutor is in touch, somehow there is that first connection that person will be seen that day. Then they will have specialist support and assessment within two weeks. In many parts of the NHS, that will take you 18 months. Now, that then provides for us, so I'm now getting to the answer to your question, um, that now provides for us a completely different basis of information and engagement to think about how we deal with issues around, for example, mitigating circumstances. So we had a big reform last year of mitigating circumstances which went through Senate uh, in the July uh, meeting to think about how we do this um, more efficiently, uh, even more humanely, in an even more engaged way. And we'll be rolling some of that work out this year. But it's going to be a really important project with the SU to understand how that rolls out, but also to how to understand how this hopefully greatly improved system of support can be connected into that to help support those students who have those kind of challenges. So the board recently covered the university's failure to inform victims of the group chat who returned this year that two of the perpetrators banned for one year would not be back on campus, given that you personally apologised on the BBC for failing to communicate with the victims as well as the complainants, and in the context of the independent review outcomes promises, do you feel that you have failed the, those victims? I feel it was a very complicated case about who had what knowledge about who was involved because this wasn't about pe the victims who had complained this was about others who were affected and um, personal data is protected um, as much as it possibly can be in our new system that we have now uh, launched 
where we will have a liaison officer to work with students, that situation won't happen again because we'll have people who will directly be working with, informing, connecting uh, those who have complained, those who are affected with where the developments are. I am really sorry, I am really sorry that you ran that story because of those complaints. I'm sorry that happened. Uh, I want it not to happen again and that's why we've set up this part of the system that we have having student layers and officers, two layers with students, so they can understand where we are in the process, what's going on, what will happen next, um, and to the extent to which it's um, possible and desirable, advance information about what's coming out. Much of the disciplinary reform at the university as a result of the group chat case addresses the issue of sexual misconduct in line with Dr Passard's review. Um, however, have other issues arising from the group chat, such as the use of racist, ableist and anti-Semitic language, been given the same priority? So the way in which the, the work plan has been developed is there are two distinct phases. The and as you know, there are 30 recommendations, so we're addressing all of those recommendations over the two phases. The first phase uh, has a focus on values, on the disciplinary framework and on sexual violence and misconduct. The second phase will include all of those elements that you just described, precisely because of that point. Hate crime across the piece is unacceptable. So we need to do work, and we are committed to do it over the course of the next phase, to make sure that we have the supporting framework policies in all of these different domains, working with students and student union, to sit alongside sexual violence and misconduct, <coughs> so that we have a suite of policies that will address all these issues. We, we have not completed our work with the uh, PSORD report until we have finished the end of phase two. Uh, and of course, as you'll know in the way that you've read it, that's, that's the way she set it up as well. You know, there are these are the things you can do, immediately, you must <laughs> do immediately, that's what we've been focusing on. And these are the things that we need to do uh, in, in the next phase of time. So, what you've just said is absolutely core business for phase two of the work. Other universities in the UK have introduced unconscious bias training, additional welfare support and ways to tackle higher discontinuation rates among BAME students. What measures does Warwick have in place to address the lack of representation and discrimi discrimination felt by BAME students? Um, so um, that's, there's, there's a lot of things in that question, <laughs> a lot of things in that question. Let, let me start at the, um, at the end of... Um, feelings of discrimination. Let me start with that point because that, that's kind of the heart of a lot of things that, uh, that we need to do. And a lot of things we need to do is about listening. So there's been a lot of, a lot of listening to people about what uh, real lived experiences are. Um, a lot of that work, and so this is not just about students. This is about everybody on campus who are from a BAME background. Um, so one of the purposes of that social inclusion com uh, committee is, is for those voices to come forward, to have a space where those sets of issues can be raised. Um, that then informs quite a lot of that training and mainstream work. Um, somebody says something makes them feel excluded. The person who has said it or done it doesn't realise or has just you know just done what they've always done. There has to be a mechanism of putting those two things together so people can understand what happens. And some of our training courses, some of our mainstream work is, is what that is all about. That that's about culture, and that's that's long term and 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 really hard and important work. In parallel to that, if we think about some of the um, student issues, so you, mean, you, you talked about uh, continuation rates, and one of the things that we're doing a lot of work on at the moment through Chris Hughes and the Education Executive is to understand a lot more detail about non-continuation. Where is non-continuation and, and what is non-continuation and what are the sorts of factors that have impacts there? The sort of sharpest piece of this, I suppose, is, is black attainment gap. So black attainment gap is the sort of sharpest piece because it's um, utterly unacceptable. Uh, and, and actually, probably if you go back in, in, in universities five years ago, utterly invisible. That's now been surfaced uh, and we can now understand what, what might be at the heart of this. So again, working with the SU, working with students, there's a huge amount of work going on in the Higher Education Academy, for example, about decolonising the, 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 the curriculum. So um, that's quite scary to some people. But, but actually what it is about is saying where are there really important voices in your subject that haven't been heard? That's not such a scary thing. Um, and that's a project which, um, as you will all know, is going ahead quite quickly in some departments, and other departments are thinking harder about what it might mean. But it's a, it's a mindset, it's an approach, it's a way of thinking about what it is that we need to do differently. And one of the great things, I hope I'm not 
uh, causing the, uh, too much risk here. One of the great things about this place is we haven't had pushback about decolonising the curriculum. It hasn't become a big kind of scandal, a really terrible, scary thing, um, because it has really been about, you know, why are you not looking at all the voices about your subject that should be listened to? So I think there are, there are a number of examples of this, this sort. Um, there's a, there's a programme of work um, which you will probably have seen from the Education Executive which addresses a number of these sets of issues, including of course um, uh, right back at the admission uh, of students into this university. So we have been um, extraordinarily successful in the last few years in terms of the increasing numbers of BAME students coming to this university undergraduate programme, incredibly successful. Um, and, and also uh, looking at different groups within that, incredibly successful actually at att attracting black British students. Um, uh, I get this wrong now and I'll look at Peter and say yes he remembers it right. We're either outside London, we're either second or third uh, in terms of the number of, 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 of black students, we can check it later. Yeah, check it. Um, which, is a, which is a fantastic thing, uh, but of course coming with that is expectation that we move faster and that's good expectation. So lots of, lots of different pieces, it's a core element of our education strategy, it's a core part, social inclusion is a core part of our strategy, it's a core part now of, of what we're doing in terms of the governance, but it's a lot of culture change work that we've got to engage with. So student activism is on the rise across universities in the UK, um, and we've also seen this at work in the form of strikes and protests on the handling of the group chat and also on issues like climate change. Um, do you think that activism is an effective way for students to change or inform policy at Warwick? Yes. Okay. I say Warwick. Um, <laughs> it, it always has been. I mean, I, it, it, is, it, is it on the rise? Um, I mean, it, it's kind of always on the rise. You know, you go back uh, at any point really in the last 10 years, that there, there may be, you know, um, a, a, a quieter few terms or something, but, you know, there's always, there's always an issue. And, so why I say yes is that I think one of the fantastic things about this place is that somehow we manage to attract people who, who actually want to come and study here and change the world at the same time. And that's brilliant. Sometimes it's quite uncomfortable. But it's also brilliant because what is a university about at the end of the day if it's not really about you know, trying to find ways of making things better? Um, and student voices and that are very, very powerful. I mean, student voices obviously in, in, in the whole series of issues around uh, climate emergency are critical. Um, because they are absolutely critical. Um, that's really interesting at the moment, you know, the whole way in which national debate is framed, you know, the battle for climate emergency versus Brexit to get the sort of top billing. I mean, it's, it's really interesting stuff. And depending on who you talk to, the first thing people will talk to you about is Brexit or, or it will be about, about climate. And, you know, at some point, we have to decide which of the two is the most important. And, you know, I hate Brexit and everything to do with it. But it's the climate that's going to kill us. Um, so, you know, somehow we've got to get to that point of being able to express that and, and, and have that kind of debate and really, you know, student activism, the way you just described, is, is one of those is one of those routes. The only thing I say, because I'm really boring, is that there are ways of doing activism and there are ways of not doing activism. There are ways of doing activism that are respectful for, for people. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about people going about their work or going home or picking up kids or whatever it might be, and there are ways of not. But you'd expect to say that, wouldn't you? So locals have expressed their frustrations towards the studentification of their neighbourhoods, leading to schisms on waste, noise pollution and other issues. Does the university do anything to integrate students into the local communities surrounding campus? Yeah, so it's, it's a really mixed message actually. It's not quite as stark as, as you would say because there's a lot of people in local communities around who really welcome students. So it's a much more mixed message and as we know st students do a huge amount of voluntary work and other kind of work to connect into communities. Uh, we do have some particular sets of issues. There are, unfortunately, a minority of students whose behaviour is um, not good. We support, um, uh, of course, in Leamington, uh, there's the Street Marshals programme, uh, fantastic collaboration with the SU, that's really important. Um, we're trying to work with, we are working with the City Council in Canley and around there as well in terms of housing support officer, which we're putting some money into funding. Um, and, and supporting, which is about you know, behaviour effectively uh, in these areas. Um, there's a lot of challenge I know in, in Coventry as in CV1 around, um, around student behaviours. That's less our students, it's more Coventry Uni students just because of where people live. But what it has done is it's opened up a, a conversation between us as a university, Coventry University and City Council about whether there's more that we can do together um, to help in some of these spaces. So um, we put in some money, we're putting in some support mechanisms where we're having conversations. There are one or two um, resident groups which are incredibly hostile to students uh, 
an incredibly good start to the university as well. Uh, and that's a set of relationships we have to manage. Um, so what is the university doing to combat the issue of casualisation of staff and students employed at Warwick? So we have a, a, a big programme um, that I describe as decasualisation that uh, should come to a completion by the end of this academic for implementation next academic year, which will put um, a, a very, very large percentage of people who are in the category that you just described onto uh, regular contracts. Um, it is a, a two-year programme that people will be able to go on to, uh, fully paid, um, and it is a sort of apprenticeship model. So you learn, uh, you've got a lot of training courses, you learn a lot of the skills, not just of teaching, but of presentation, and a lot of other things as well. That's where we'll get to. We had a, a really important meeting uh, two weeks ago about the proposals which have been built up together um, with the trades unions uh, and also with Warwick anti casualisation who were content for us now to move these proposals forward through our governance mechanism. So um, my hope is, as, as promised 12 months ago, that by the end of this cycle we will have not only um, adopted the, um, the proposals but we will implement them.